In April 2015, Desmond Cole wrote the cover story in Toronto Life magazine. It landed like a meteorite, with seismic revelations about racism in general and the police practice of carding in particular. The intervening five years since that award-winning piece have been nothing short of intense. As we learn in his new book, it's called The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. Desmond Cole is a freelance journalist and activist, and he joins us now for more. So good to have you back here. Thank you for having me. It's been me. a few years, so we're glad to have you here. This book that you have just written, um, essentially each chapter is a month in the year of 2017. Mm -hmm. What made that year so significant as to be worthy of chronicling in the way you have? I think it was that I was searching for a theme to tie in the stories that I wanted to tell. And in the summer of 2017, I was talking to different people about, here's what I'm thinking about doing. I was thinking at that time of taking a much more historical approach to this book uh, than I ended up taking. There's definitely a lot of history and context in this book to fill in what happens in 2017. But I was thinking about it a little heavier on the historical side back then. One of the people I spoke with was Dion Brand, who has a little bit of history with writing and publishing. And I told her about this idea of going back more in history. And she just bluntly was like, don't do that, Desmond, because you're living in a really interesting moment. You're doing journalism and activism now in a really interesting moment, right about what's happening right now. And I took her very literally. It was the summer of 2017. There were things happening that I thought were really interesting. I took real good care to document the back half of 2017 while it was happening. And then I started looking back through the beginning part of the year. What stories were going on? What was I thinking about? What was I working on back then? What was I tweeting about? And I figured, Every month of the year could represent not just a story that happened that month, but a larger context. So if you're going to talk about education and young people being disciplined in school, what's the history of that in Ontario or Canada? If you're going to talk about young black people more and more being apprehended in the child welfare system, which we are, what's the history of that? What's the history of immigration when we see Haitian people in 2017 coming to the Quebec border or the Manitoba border? What's the history of that event in 2017? So I give the story and the context in each chapter. And we will go deeper into those stories. But I, I find, in my experience, that people write books because they have to. They've got something that, that just sort of burns in them and they got to say it. What was that in this case? It was the desire to see two things, I guess. One being more fulsome coverage of stories that I read about in our media, but I thought there's not enough here. There's not enough here for the audience to really truly appreciate the story. So I want to go deeper. Um, I did that, for example, in the case, the first story I tell in the book is about a young man named John Samuels, who's an artist in Toronto who had a New Year's Eve party the end of 2016, who didn't get a liquor license for that party, and who had a few bottles of alcohol, which the liquor license people just somehow showed up to, of all the places they could have been, they showed up to his New Year's Eve party and said, you don't have a license, give us your alcohol. John did that, and his New Year's Eve party at his art gallery continued until multiple police cruisers showed up a few moments later came in and essentially performed a raid on the gallery where they smashed the windows of the gallery, told all of his guests to leave, and John was tased multiple times by the police, and then he was charged with assaulting them, which is a classic thing that happens to black people in these interactions with police. And the details that you don't spare us are really quite incredible in the book. Um, I wonder, why do you think that happened that way? That particular story follows such a clear pattern for me. I think that what, what John explains actually to me that I relate in the book is that he felt that he was being surveilled in that neighborhood from the moment that he got this art gallery. Because? Because he's black. And because people don't want a young black man not only holding his own space in the neighborhood, but inviting other young black people to come and do shows and do musical events white people in this day and age still, still find that to be inherently threatening. So the cops started coming. The cops started looking around his space all the time, you asking him at, questions. At the request of the white people in the neighborhood, do you think? He believes that, for sure. And I, and I think that my own experiences and my own documentation of 
police carding and the larger regime of police surveillance tells us that that's how it goes down. It's not that the police find their way to us. They are guided to us by people in communities who are saying this person either doesn't belong here or is a threat to the safety of white folks in the community. And that's what John believes. And he tells that very clearly about how he always felt like he was being watched. So it was only a matter of time before something like this violent police intervention took place. I'm trying to remember, uh, was this in Yorkville where the gallery was or where was it? Uh, Bloor West, so Bloor kind West. of High right. Park area. Right, right, right. And that's the thing is that it's like so hard to get physical space in Toronto. Mm -hmm. There's this building that's slated to be demolished for condos and he gets a short term lease mm -hmm. to pursue this dream of his of having a gallery, a young man who's an artist, who's doing his thing. And now he's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur when you're black, the stigma, the stereotypes and the fear, they remain. Because the, the thinking is if, it, it, you know, if you black folks want to set up an art gallery in a black neighborhood, that's great, but don't try it anywhere else? Of course. That's and, the conclusion. I, I mean, yeah. I, 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 and this is the problem with what people call a multicultural city. I think it's more accurate to say is a segregated city. Because if you can't be in whole spaces, I mean, Steve, one of the most fascinating things I've found about Toronto in the last 30 years is that as the entire population of Toronto has become more black and brown and other racialized people, the downtown core has become more white. That tells me everything that I need to know about this city, that the downtown has become the playground for the rich, who are overwhelmingly white, and they have managed to push us out through the so-called revitalization of places like Regent Park, Lawrence Heights, Alexandra Park. We are not welcome downtown, and the police's job has become to push us out of these spaces and to enforce us when we're in them. Does that phenomenon, as you've described it, in your view, happen in other cities in this province and country as well? It's, 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 it's universal. There isn't something special about Toronto that makes that dynamic prevalent. This is also the part of the answer to your question about why write a book about all of these things and why tie all of these stories about different parts of the country together. Not only is white supremacy and anti-black racism systemic uh, and, and like, universal in Canada, it's a global phenomenon. My parents immigrated here from the other side of the world from a country that had already been colonized by the British. Is that Sierra Leone? That's correct, that's Sierra Leone. So Africans come to Canada and they're told, oh my goodness, you're English, so good. It's like, yeah, wanna know why? Like, we can't escape the global um, echoes of colonialism, of imperialism, of the British and the French and the Portuguese and other European countries trying to establish empire around the world. Mm -hmm. Certainly we still swear allegiance to a queen in this country, so we know that those things aren't mm -hmm. just a vestige of the past, they still function in our day-to-day -day lives. Desmond, can I confess that I have, um, I have been fascinated watching your career as a journalist and activist and so on evolve over the past decade or more and you have certainly made your mark and you were here about 10 years ago and we had a conversation about politics back then and you know what just for fun let's play a clip of you 10 years ago okay and then we'll come back and chat about how your politics have evolved over the ensuing decade sure sheldon if you would the clip the best way to get involved is to actually do something one of the organizations that we are partnering with on this campaign is Student Vote. Student Vote goes into schools with kids who can't vote yet, and they do mock elections, because their idea is the best way to learn how to be part of the system is actually to participate in doing. It's not necessarily to be removed from the process back watching. So we want people to actually get involved, and that first time that somebody has to go and vote, that's the time that they're the most excited, that's the time that they want to go out and learn the most about their community, learn the most about the issues, so that they can feel like when they go and vote, if that's what they want to do, they're really out there and making an informed choice. And, and we think that the best way to encourage that is to actually get people to go and do it. Your passion and interest was evident then. I wonder if you could tell us, though, how you think your politics have changed over the ensuing decade. That young man on that screen was very beautiful and precious, I must say. I'm like, it's, <laughs> ni it's nice to see that me. Um, I'm not that person in the same way anymore. And in that, that initiative that I was fighting for over 10 years ago was about non-citizen voting, which I still support and believe in, but our proposal at that time was limited 
to permanent residents being able to vote in our municipal elections. Uh, if I were to launch a campaign like that again today, I wouldn't limit it to permanent residents. I would say all non-citizen residents need to vote in Toronto's and Ontario's elections. That's because as time has gone on, the notion that none of us are free until all of us are has really started to permeate all of my politics. The notion that asking the system for incremental change is the way that we make progress, that no longer resonates with me. Um, I think that sometimes you have to ask for everything from the state just to get a tiny, tiny amount of change. And that's been my experience doing campaigns like that one. We were never successful in getting the Ontario government to even commit to that incremental step of permanent residents being able to vote in elections. The non-citizen population in Ontario con continues to go up, but there's still no remedy for people in terms of voting. So now, while I want people to vote if that's what they want to do, I think that there are much more fundamental changes that we need to make to make sure that folks are included. Let's talk education. You do refer in the book to the Safe Schools Act, which was something brought in, I guess, about, well, it's 20 years ago anyway, I guess now, 20 years ago by the uh, Mike Harris government That's back right. in the day. And here's an excerpt from the book. You write, Premier Mike Harris and his education minister, Janet Ecker, won re-election in 1999, partly on the promise of a zero-tolerance approach to violence and misbehavior in schools. Um, how do you know that? How do I know that that's partly the reason they won? Yeah. Well, because we remember the campaign. I mean, they cited that there was this kind of lack of discipline in our schools and that violence was being tolerated and accepted too much and that it was making our schools an unsafe place. Why else create an act that you're calling the Safe Schools Act? The Harris government also brought in what they called the Safe Streets Act. They had this whole mantra in that 99 campaign that was someone is making your life, your schools, your streets an unsafe and uninhabitable environment. And if you elect us, we will clean up the problem. What did you think the agenda of that was? I think it was in the service of teachers who were like, we need certain kids out of our classroom. We don't have the rules right now to kick them out. We need stronger rules to be able to get certain kids who we believe are a distraction to other kids' education out of the classroom. Do I infer from this that you think this is white teachers asking a mostly white government to get mostly black kids out of their mostly white classes? Not always. No. Not okay. always. But that's the thing about white supremacy is that that's what's going to happen in any system that relies on discipline. Steve, it doesn't have to be a school. Ask people at work where they work in institutions. Ask people who have prison sentences in this country, and lots of research has been done. Same crime, different sentencing if you're black or indigenous. For sure. We don't need to relitigate those things. So if you're going to give out a system in a school that uh, encourages the school to engage in more harsh discipline, of course black students are going to be affected more because their behavior is more scrutinized from the beginning by the teaching establishment. Let's do another example from education. And in doing so, let me preface it by saying, uh, we had a great conversation around here about whether or not I should ask you this next question because you refer to something that I wrote once upon a time. I did. And I didn't want to bring it up just because you mentioned me in it, but I didn't want to avoid it and have you think, well, he's too chicken to bring up the example that he's involved with here. So I think we ultimately landed on a spot where we thought, let's just try it and see what the heck happens here. This was, again, a couple of years ago, to, uh, I guess, uh, I can't remember what month it was, but it was in 2017. And there was a York Region District School Board trustee who was absolutely uh, in the crosshairs because uh, she used the N-word yes. in describing a parent. She didn't use it to that parent, but she described that parent using the N-word uh, because this parent was uh, attempting to see some reform in the schools and deal with an issue that was a great concern. Let's just start with this. What did you think that whole episode was indicative of? Nancy LG using that racial slur against Charlene Grant and then refusing to resign after it was reported that she said it was emblematic for me of the notion that white people should always be forgiven for the harm that they do to black people and that 
holding them accountable is being presented as the threat rather than them having to take some consequences for what they've done. I would correlate it with Justin Trudeau engaging in blackface in his words more times than he can remember, mm -hmm. but then the onus being on us as black people to immediately forgive him so that we didn't end up with an even worse conservative government. This is how anti-black racism works. It puts the onus on us and says that white people should be forgiven. That's what I saw in the Nancy LG situation. She did apologize. She eventually resigned. Were you content with the way it worked out? It took too long. She fought too hard. She made too many excuses for why she deserved to stay, as did her family. Even the newspaper, the Toronto Star, ran an op-ed by her children, of all people, arguing why she shouldn't face consequences for using the N-word. She didn't deny ever that she said it, but her children were in a newspaper saying, you don't understand all of the facts. They weren't there. They weren't questioning the basic premises of the story. It was just that our mom has a legacy of fighting for human rights, very much like Justin Trudeau once again. So it's as if white people are inoculating themselves against any accountability by saying, but in the past, I fought for you in some way. In the past, I advocated for you. So now when I've harmed you, I shouldn't be held accountable. Okay, and here's where it now gets a little sticky, because I would like to get into some of the stuff uh, as it relates to you and me here. Sure. Uh, I, I, I recall, and again, two and a half years ago, so I don't have it perfectly in my head, but I recall writing a piece at the time saying something along the lines of, of course we can name and shame and, and, and insist that she resign, and of course that's an option, it's tried, tested, and true. And then I think I brought up the example of a player for the Montreal Canadiens who had, in the midst of a game, in a ferocious moment on the ice, uh, called one of his opponents a faggot. And it became public. And the options at that point were to suspend him for the whole year or mm -hmm. something, or try something different. And what they did was that they made this player, they, they explained to this player why what he did was wrong, and he became at that point a champion for LGBTQ rights and now continues as a kind of a goodwill ambassador spreading the word that this kind of homophobia has no place in the game. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what I wrote at the time was, what if we use that approach with Nancy Helge? Mm -hmm. And you didn't care for that approach. No. Okay, tell me why. Because you lose, first of all, the authority to be that ambassador for me anyway when you engage in that behavior and don't immediately take accountability for it. Well, and remember, she'd bumped her head and, and, and had, had a concussion, and which was, it was thought, part of the explanation why she said what she said. That's no more an explanation for anyone using that word, in my opinion, than is Rob Ford getting drunk and saying, in a drunken stupor, I engage in calling people the N-word or I engage in certain other antisocial behavior. Those things don't cut it for me. I'm a grown person and I don't want to hear that when I'm being harmed, there's a good explanation and that there's a good reason for it. And the other, you know what the other thing is, Steve? How come a person can't learn from their error and take accountability? Why can't somebody who engages in that kind of harmful behavior step back from what they're doing, take some time to reflect? Like, why is there this rush to amend in a way that keeps them in the position of authority or power that they're in. Why can't there ever be consequences? If Justin Trudeau wanted to take accountability for wearing blackface, could he not do so while not being prime minister? What should he have done? He should have resigned. He, he hasn't, ju the, the, uh, Justin Trudeau is about to go and probably give a black history munch speech, speech somewhere and I think he should be laughed off the stage by any black person within a foot of him. He has no credibility to speak to us about diversity. He won't say anti-black racism, by the way. He won't say white supremacy for sure. That's what we should be talking about. But we don't need Justin Trudeau. He's not black. He's not the person who needs to play the role of teaching other people. He needs to get out of the way and allow those of us who have been fighting this to say what we need to say, people like that can amplify black and indigenous and other people's voices. They don't have to be in the spotlight. Okay, we could go on on this, but sure. we got other stuff to talk about as well. Let's talk uh, uh, about uh, how you see police protecting their power. And here we go. Police understand that their ability to enact violence with impunity is the defining feature of their job. They know that if one officer's use of force can be criminalized, 
all officers' ability to use force indiscriminately is at risk, and they will stop at nothing to protect that power. Okay, you, you, I mean, you've really hit it over the head there. The defining feature of their job, you want to put it that strongly? Yeah, uh, police officers are the only people in our society who are legally allowed to use violence. And they are legally allowed to use violence up to the point of taking someone's life. They're supposed to, they're supposed to you know, exercise good judgment in doing so, of course. Uh, they are supposed to. That is the fantasy, I think, that a group of officers who's, let's, let's, again, historical context, right? So let's not just fantasize what we would like policing to be. Let's first acknowledge that the reason that modern policing exists is to control the indigenous populations of this country, Northwestern Mounted Police, now the RCMP, and local patrols like the Toronto Force, which literally were slave catchers, which were going around on these territories 200 years ago saying, that black person walking around, we'd better check him or her out. So now we have street checks of majority black people in majority black places 200 years later. I'm just not gonna pretend that those are different. You're gonna draw a straight I'm line between? I'm gonna draw a straight really? line between those two things because the mentality that informs them is the same. Back then, a black person who's supposed to be somebody's property on a plantation in Montreal or Nova Scotia or somewhere else, they are a threat to the society by being allowed to walk out. I talk about Negro frolics. That's the first chapter name of the book. That's a law from 1780s Shelburne, Nova Scotia, which forbid black loyalists who had just won their freedom in the Revolutionary War coming to Nova Scotia. That law of Negro frolics prevent, prevented them from drinking in the street, dancing in public, and what was John doing on New Year's Eve? Partying and dancing with his friends in a place where he could be seen and called out. Steve, it hasn't changed. So to pretend now that what the police's job really is to do is to bring law and order, why don't they get held cons uh, accountable then when they don't do that? Why is it so hard, I would ask, to hold a police officer accountable? Because of exactly what I say, that the fear is Holding police accountable, particularly for violence against black or indigenous people, threatens their very purpose. Can I state the obvious? The chief of police in the city of Toronto is a black man. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's made any difference? Mm -hmm. And why not? Because the only way you get to be Mark Saunders is by upholding the police state. You can't be Mark Saunders saying, this anti-black violence will end the day I get here because the rank and file will not follow somebody who says that. That's the other fantasy, is that somebody who's black can lead a paramilitary organization and tell all of the troops what to do. The troops will stab you in your back the second that you turn around because the troops are serving a system where they have a job to do. And police see their job very often as being an occupying force in black spaces, going in there and controlling things. And Steve, I talk about how in the book, we've given every job now to police as it relates to black people. Kids doing bad in school, no social worker, no guidance counselor, no, bring a cop with a gun into the school and that will help just the black students. It won't help rich private school white kids who are misbehaving. Only the black kids need a supervisor with a gun. Somebody in the community is having a mental health crisis? Don't bring somebody who knows how to speak and do de-escalation and say, can we get you some help? Bring the person with the gun. The cop in our context is every job, every occupation, because the, the fear is we can't approach black people in Canada without force. Something's gonna go wrong, well, something's gonna be dangerous. That's one interpretation. Another interpretation is that, that some people want those cops in the schools because they think they make the schools safer. And some of them are black. But hmm. where is the proof showing that having a police officer in school makes it safer? I wouldn't condone it in any case. But Steve, we found out that the cops who are in the schools in Toronto in the SRO program were having a meeting every week with Canada Border Service Agency personnel. There's only one reason why local police officers who are specifically stationed in schools would need to meet with border agents. And that's what we've been talking about for years in Toronto about don't ask, don't tell. About kids who don't have status being able to go to school as the province of Ontario guarantees them the right to do. Every child has the right to go to school in this province, whether they are documented or not. And having cops there getting information about them and their family members 
jeopardizes their ability to have an education and could get them deported. And we dared, people like Mark Saunders dared to ask those people, some of the most vulnerable people who are having cops watch them in their communities and schools, just come down to the police headquarters for a meeting and tell us why this makes you scared and threatened. That's the false reality that we're asking of undocumented people. So my views about policing are not mine. They're not new. This is not new idea or new theory. Black people have been writing about and thinking about these ideas in Canada and across the Western world for decades. So I'm building on traditions of radical black feminism. I'm building on the traditions of people who see the system was designed to keep us under control rather than guarantee our rights as equal people. And that's why the system itself has to be overhauled and dismantled. I can't believe how fast the time has gone uh, because we have so much more to talk about. We've talked for almost a half an hour here. Uh, I should point out as well that not only in the capital city of Ontario, but in the capital city of the country, the new police chief is black as well. Yep. Do you regard him the same way as you do Chief Saunders? It's not about them personally, Steve. In the same way that Ahmed Hussein, being the federal minister of immigration, didn't stop the government from trying to deport Abdul Abdi, who was here as a child and who didn't get his citizenship because Child Welfare Services took him into their care but didn't file those papers. It happened again with another young man after Abdul called Abdullahi Elmi. So we made a petition to the government, stop doing this to kids who are here from African countries, this particularly from Somalia, stop taking them into your care as the government but not getting their citizenship documents. We won this situation with Abdul, stop that deportation, we had to do it again. Does the government propose now we will not doc or we will not deport young children who have been here as minors, who've not gotten their citizenship documents as a result of government ne neglect? Where is that legislation, Steve? It doesn't exist. So the liberal government wants the right, even with a black uh, immigration and citizenship minister, to adjudicate on a case-by-case -case basis and to send people to die to some of the most dangerous places in the world because that is the value of black life in this country in 2020. It's not up to individuals like Peter Slawley. He's the chief in Ottawa. Chief in Ottawa. Mark Saunders, Ahmed Hussein. It's not up to individual black people to go in there and convince a system that's doing wrong by us that it has to change. So, okay, last 30 seconds here. One way to get stuff changed in this world is to run for office. Sure. When are you gonna do that? Oh, I already did. I and, know. <laughs> and I But er, almost everybody loses the first time. I guess so. I, I, the remedies that we need are bigger than me and they're bigger than any one person that could enter the system no matter how ambitious. I want us to dismantle the systems like the child welfare system, like the policing and prison systems that do the harm. And Steve, you find me the political party in Canada that wants a leader going around saying those things and wouldn't, as I mentioned, stab him in the back the second that they turned around. That's not what party politics in this country is for. Party politics is necessarily optimistic in that way about the future of our country. I am not because I want to recognize the real change that's needed. That change is bigger than party politics. There's so. no, uh, th there is party politics at City Hall, but mm -hmm. not, not overtly with the same kind of party discipline as at Queen's Park or in the federal parliament. Why don't mm -hmm. you give City Hall another try? You know, I, just this one quick thing, okay? As a black person, I'm like scared to do things like get on the transit system without a ticket because somebody could take my life. I live near St. Clair Avenue West where a young man was pulled off of a subway or a streetcar, excuse me, and beaten because they didn't think he had the fare. Yep. So you know what I would really like? Without having to run for mayor, I'd like somebody at City Hall to protect black people so that if they don't have the money to get on the train, they can still ride, Steve. That's the kind of change I'm looking for. And if I have to go and put myself up for office, we have bigger problems in this country. That's Desmond Cole. His new book, The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power, is now available. Thanks Thank for coming so into TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. 
We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.